lights off on the, on the way here. Uh, some of these slides won't show up that well without it. Yeah, that, that's a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I went over uh, to, shortly after I resigned from teaching. I resigned in 1983 and uh, bought and operated our parents, my parents, uh, golf course that my wife and I had helped build and, and develop. And so I had my January's and February's free. And uh, so I had these interests coming from uh, my master's was in East Asian history in the 20th century, uh, the subject matter. And uh, then the first Sloan students were coming. I had, I had a few of them in class. And so uh, I thought, well, you know, a lot of them are coming to Wausau. It'd be really, really interesting to go over and see where they came from and, and uh, to be able to come back and, and tell some of their stories. So in 1989, uh, I came over to Thailand, and actually, uh, here's Ban Manai, that's the Hmong refugee camp. And uh, I got lost, I got on the wrong bus, and uh, I don't even know what town I was in over here. And uh, I, got it, they, I showed the bus driver where I was going, he said, no, 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 <laughs> off the bus, they drop you off on the street corner. <laughs> and uh, so I showed the kids with their penny bikes, I said, this is what I want to get, they said, no, no, not on our bikes, you know. So I drew a picture of a bus, and this one kid took me home. They gave me breakfast. And then we walked around out to run around the house to I could see they had a pickup, and we started talking bots or, or dollars or whatever uh, money. And then I had a beautiful drive out to Ban Manai along with his uh, this man and his daughter who spoke no English, uh, but we had a great time. So it was, it was kind of fun. Uh, in 1990, I came back over. I had a good friend, uh, Brian Heidel from Wausau. And he was an NGO, and he was working at some of these camps. And so I not only went to Ban Banai, I went to Panat Nakong, which was the uh, boat people, Vietnamese boat people camp, but it was also the transition camp for uh, people from Ban Banai that were coming to the U.S. And they would teach uh, some English, you know, whatever they could, in the about six month period that they had. And so I sat in, and it was a resource in English classes at times, and. And you know there's going to be some problems for a number of them because the grasp of English and culture coming from where they came from is an immense leap. And uh, so it, that was very interesting. I also got over to uh, to Site 2 and Khao Dung, which were Cambodian or Khmer camps on uh, this border of Thailand. And 350,000 Cambodians in Site 2. And Khao Dung, if you saw the killing fields, and uh, at the end, uh, uh, the character comes climbing this mountain, he looks down and sees Khao Dung, and he's free because he now he's in Thailand. Well, there are no mountains. <laughs> so that was, that was uh, uh, the cinematic, uh, you know, you wanted to show him climbing and then being relieved and looking down, but uh, uh, he would have come on a straight flat plane, actually. Uh, uh, so those are the places, but what we're going to talk about mainly today would be Ban Banai, and then also uh, about Laos, because I was there in 1999 and 2000, going to some of the villages, in Hmong villages in uh, Shenkwang province, is where most of the Hmong people live. Okay, why don't we start? Well, just a, a picture that's, uh, you know, uh, rather sad and, and uh, uh, tells a lot of the history. Here's a couple of young kids who are playing with some really rusty metal. I don't know if I let my kids do that. Uh, but uh, uh, metal from the, uh, uh, from the war period was the biggest resource that uh, Laos had when I was there. And so people were always going out and finding pieces of metal and bringing them in because they could make some money on it. Well, of course, uh, the kids see that. And they want to help their folks. So they go around, they see some metal, they go around and pick it up. There are about 70 million unexploded bombings in uh, Laos. This is one of the most heavily bombed places in the world. And uh, uh, about a third of the bombings are the small bomblets that uh, uh, cluster bombs let loose. And we'll take a look at one of those later. Uh, but they let loose, about one third of them did not explode an impact. So, uh, more tonnage of bombs is dropped on Laos than all of the bombing in World War II. And this is just a tiny little place. Okay. Uh, 
Shenkong province is right about up in here. And uh, it's kind of a valley pointed at uh, Hanoi. And so even when the French owned, uh, uh, owned uh, as a colony, owned Indochina, uh, when the Viet Minh were fighting against a free uh, Vietnam from the French, in 1953, before they had won their victory, they sent troops in and uh, cooperated with a group called the Pata Lao, which would be the, uh, the Communist Lao. And they helped build them up because they were afraid that if any enemy group, the French, uh, in this case, would control this valley, that they could uh, flank and be in danger uh, Hanoi. And uh, so the, actually the Laotian War begins in 1953, before you know, before the French had surrendered, and before our war starts there. This war con continues from 1953 to 1975. So it's, it's of a long duration. And it's located in a state that's hardly a state, in the modern sense of the word. If you talk about a state being an organized government that uh, uh, has claims on the loyalty of the, uh, the people, civic claims, and uh, that is able to formulate uh, uh, civic uh, society, that doesn't make sense. This is a kingdom. Uh, <coughs> the power of the kingdom ex extended as far as they could tax and enforce the tax. And, uh, but as far as property lines and boundaries of countries, Hmong, you know, different Hmong people used to flow between southwestern China and northern Vietnam through the mountains at ease. There was no border crossings or anything. And so uh, uh, this, the, the mountains were kind of the, the ocean that the Hmongs could swim in. And Lao and Chinese soldiers did not like climbing and getting up high in the mountains to rivers. Whereas the Hmong and other mountain art groups, uh, they specialized in that. So they could, uh, they could freely defend themselves in areas like this. So in 1999, they went to Shenkong province and here, uh, in 2000, I went up by Luang. Oh, what's what's uh, I forget the the village name up here, but it, it wasn't a very large city. And then uh, I spent a little time up there, and then I crossed into China at Mengla, and then worked my way up to Kunming, and that is where the Hmong in China originated. Then it went, in the 1700s, uh, they moved down into. Uh, uh, Vietnam because the Chinese military was threatening them in China and then some of the people uh, after a military apparent defeat in, in Vietnam moved off into Laos. So they get there around 1800, late 1700s, like early 1800s. And uh, uh, it's, they can do that, well let's go, we'll, we'll do this with some pictures from here. They can do that because they claim land that nobody else wants. The Hmong were the top of the mountain. I mean, they, 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 could, they had a culture developed that they could farm the tops of the mountains. And nobody else was there. So they could move in and take their place. If you want to see where you are in Laos or countries like this, you take an altimeter along and see what altitude you're at. If you're lowland, you're in Lao country. But uh, you can go Ha and different, uh, uh, different uh, groups as you go up the mountainside. When you get to the top, you're in Hmong country. And uh, uh, here, this is the plain of Jars, which was the strategic battlefield during the secret war. Uh, it's secret because we waged the, uh, the war through the CIA. And uh, we weren't supposed to be there. <coughs> and so we, uh, we utilized the uh, Air America, which sounds like a civilian airline. It wasn't, it was CIA owned and operated. And uh, we supplied and armed and equipped an army of Hmong people up here in the north. We also were working with the Royal Lao Army in Nanchen and in the south. Uh, here you can see this was called the Plain of Jars. It's that plain that aims right toward Hanoi. So uh, it was strategic property as far as uh, North Vietnam was concerned. So we have four distinct characters here. We have the North Vietnamese who want to control this because it threatens North Vietnam. We have the Papat Lao who would like to change Laos into a communist area, but they're different. They're not the same. 
And then we had the Royal Lao Army, which was aided and supported by the US. We paid all the bills, in other words. And, uh, but we also developed an army up in the Hmong area. Uh, uh, Vang Pao was the, the uh, leader of that army. And we developed them into a guerrilla organization so they could defend the North. Okay. And this is just to prove I was there. I was throwing my clothes in. Uh, the, the jars come from, uh, the stone comes from uh, Quarry Welt in the North, and it's one of those mysteries. And uh, they have found bones in some of them, which suggests they were probably uh, ways of uh, burying their, uh, their ancestors in a, an original way. Uh, here it says the CIA recruited an army of 10 to 15,000 Hmong during the Vietnam War. Uh, so as more we got involved in Vietnam, the more interested we were in, in uh, uh, this part of Laos. Because the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which supplied and supported manpower for uh, the North Vietnamese effort in South Vietnam, they went in, into Laos and down the force of, of Laos and then they could loop back into Vietnam. So that's the place we, we really wanted to bomb that trail. It wasn't a trail, it was a series of roads. But we dropped tons and tons of uh, bombs trying to, to uh, uh, cut that, that supply chain. But also by, by funding and arming the Hmong, uh, so we had an armed group that could threaten the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were also flying bombers from Udang Thani in Thailand and they would go up to Hanoi, and they would get shot up up there sometimes. The uh, uh, anti-aircraft fire would, would damage them, and they would go down in Laos. Well, the Hmong army was there in order to, uh, uh, one of the things they could do was to rescue the down pilots. And then also there was a mountain at, uh, uh, where we put some of the, uh, the uh, radar uh, so that we could target the areas in Hanoi we wanted to hit better. And so we had those three objectives. Uh, uh, that third one was, was taken eventually by the, uh, uh, by the Papa Vau in the North Vietnamese. Okay, let's go. So you go into the villages and you find the Hmong as being, a, you know, basically uh, living as people did well in the past. This is the village of uh, uh, 100 uh, roofs. And I got to visit around in there. Uh, about the mid 18th century, the, the Hmong people were moving into this area of Laos. And you can always tell a Hmong building from a Lao building. Because the Hmong built right on the ground. Uh, the soil was the, the floor. And uh, they would usually take wet rags and slurry it and then uh, let the kind of clay in the soil dry and they could get kind of a slick, uh, nice surface that you actually could sweep to keep the, the house clean. Uh, whereas most Lao places were in stilts, they were up raised above. Okay. But you can see the karst mountains surrounding Shenghuang province and Laos. Really, really rugged territory. Uh, territory that uh, uh, was tough to negotiate, and you get these uh, peasant soldiers from North Vietnam, they could operate well in the Plain of Jars, which was open and uh, you could maneuver. But you go into this highly forested, jungle uh, kind of uh, steep mountain paths and, and uh, ravines and, and so forth, and they had a hard time. So the Hmong you get that. That's why they existed in China so long as well. I mean, there's very few small cultures like the Hmong that have existed all the way through history. And that was part of their, the Chinese would often want to get them under control so they could tax them. And so they would send military against them and they, the Hmong would make them pay for it. And then they would say, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll let them alone. And they just succeeded because of the nature of the terrain, even though they were a smaller number. Uh, they made it very expensive to, to try to control them. General Bang Pao became the, uh, the uh, head of the secret uh, CIA army. And uh, Bang Pao was uh, really revered by his troops. Uh, they fought from, like I said, you know, uh, it's 65 to 73 in, in our in real involvement. And uh, in the meantime, there weren't that many young men. And so there was also a, a constant drain. Uh, there was maybe three to 400,000 Hmong in Shenghuang province. 
And so the, uh, the military, uh, uh, they lost a lot of young men. And so as they lost those young men, volunteers and units from Thailand, especially the aerial police, the, that's kind of a pair of uh, military police, uh, came up and filled the ranks uh, of the Hmong. So uh, they were involved as well. But you can see where, how this could be a very defensible kind of place that uh, is very bright. Okay. Hmong practice slash and burn agriculture. So when you, you're on the hillside, the hillside, the, you know, the top, good topsoil washes down the hill. So it's, it's not good soil. So you come in and you chop down all the trees before the, the dry season. It lays there through the drying season. And then you set them on fire during the uh, uh, end of the uh, dry, and see the dry season. And uh, they have rich ash, organic ash, and quickly work into the soil. And then that soil will be rich enough to, uh, to give you satisfactory plants for four to five years. And then after that, you pick up this whole village and you move to a different place and slash and burn another place. That's fine if you don't have too many Hmong groups doing that, because if you can give that piece of land time to recover, then you can come back eventually and, and do that. If you have too many people and you're just denuding the, the force on these steep hillsides, and it's very uh, ecologically damaging. Uh, how did they choose where they moved? Well, that was usually a shaman. And the shaman would look at the defensive characteristics uh, of the place and then whether it was close to potable water. And then you would uh, say, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the spirit of the mountain welcomes you here. So there's also that spiritual uh, part as well. And uh, so uh, I take those three measures together and the shaman would say, okay, this is the place. Okay. And here's Swinton or Sash and Burn agriculture being practiced. I went in February, which is the dry end of the drying season, dry season. And so often I would uh, come across the, uh, the burning of the fields, and in the morning the sun would rise red in the sky because of all the smoke. And uh, it's, it's just part of the villages at one to 3,000 feet on the mountainside. Often you would see your mum pound a uh, stake in, tie themselves to the stake so that you could lean back and then you would work the field because it would be too stu steep to stand up on. And it's some of the terrain that they were forced to, to practice agriculture in, but they could do it. And they, you know, they, they had a subsistence economy, which doesn't mean they're poor, it means they can sub subsist, they can live on the economic system that they had. Okay. So Nui Chu Cheng from uh, Wasa uh, provided me with a few of his uh, photos when he traveled back. And here you see the trees and the shrubbery that's all been cut down. And uh, uh, here you see Nui Chu Cheng, I believe, uh, taking a look at all that and saying, ah, I think it's dry enough to burn, okay? So then you burn it off, and now they're using maddox to, uh, to work it into the soil, to enrich the soil. Maddox is a very heavy metal hole that you swing from over your head. And of course, uh, one of the bombings down there, this, this makes it very dangerous work. And, uh, uh, but by working the, the ash into the soil, it becomes fertile enough to grow several years of crops. Okay. Here he's in, this is Nui Chu Cheng, and he's in traditional dress, and the others are, are working uh, from his family, and just pointing out again that it's, it's dangerous because of the uh, uh, the unexploded bombings or small bombs. And down below it just says, Jim Harris of Wasa leads up a, a mine removal operation in Laos and does a fantastic job. So uh, if you get a chance to buy Malaysian coffee from Jim, make sure to do that. He, he funds it all on his own fund, you know, his own efforts, and he spent six months over there. And looking at the conditions that, you know, most villages didn't have electricity or water, you know, and, uh, heat camps out, I believe, a lot, of, a lot of the time, but it's rugged living. It's rugged living for the period of time he spends over there, so, okay. And this is a model of a cluster bomb, and it's got a whole bunch of uh, uh, little bombies inside, maybe 120 or so. 
150. And inside each bami, it's filled with uh, little uh, pieces of metal that are jagged and sharp. And so when it hits the ground, it shoots the shrapnel all around. It's a terrific anti-personnel weapon. Because you've got a, a 150 or so little bombies dropping and then all these metal fragments screaming through the air all around. Can clear out a whole, whole big area very quickly. And uh, uh, they're, they're pretty devastating. And they drop a lot of this on Vietnam, I mean on Laos. Uh, more drop bombs on Laos than during World War II. Most heavily bombed country per capita in the history of warfare. This is what these people live through. Okay. And when I was walking along, I look off to the side and I'd say, oh, you know, I, I had a driver, an interpreter with me, and I said, to, what are those? And he said, well, those are dismantled. He said, you don't have to worry about them. He said, but he kept telling me, he says, walk where everybody else walks. <laughs> don't go wandering the fire field. So I took his, his uh, advice on that. Okay. You know, this was in my hotel. This is a poster showing all the different kinds of things not to touch. And then the fact that the kids see something sparkling in the ground, it can help their family by getting some metal. And then, of course, this is what happens. Uh, the war in Laos and the war in Vietnam, the war in Cambodia still is going on. And the fact that those weapons that were dropped and used in those, those years are still killing and maiming the people in those countries. And not in small numbers either, about 1,000 a, a year. And, and uh, you know, and it's not over for the maimed uh, uh, soldiers as well who got injured and so forth. Wars do not end when you say they do. They might wish they did. But it continues on in the bodies of people and in the ravaged countryside and on the unexploded ammunition that's, uh, that's still in the ground. So here you can see the, uh, the uh, fields, how steep they are. And uh, it just says that it's something about General Bang Pao about uh, the different uh, uh, purposes that we saw that were valuable to us so that we would sponsor uh, his army in, uh, uh, in uh, Laos. And here you can see the mountainside, but down here you see the lowland kind of uh, wet rice agriculture. And uh, of course, that can, uh, uh, it's lowland wet rice can support a dense population. Whereas when you get up into a uh, slash and burn, you necessarily have a small population because it, it can't, can't supply a, a large population of people. Okay. So here's a uh, Hmong family. Uh, unfortunately, during the course of the war, the North Vietnamese and the Pa Lao found and attacking the villages was one way to hurt the, the Hmong. And so they would attack the villages, and over time, village after village uh, fled to the west to Long Chen, which was a, a secret uh, base the CIA had developed. Uh, and it became a real big refugee center because it was not safe to be around the, uh, uh, the Plain of Jars. And uh, uh, every year, the war would ebb and flow during the dry season. Uh, the North Vietnamese would use their tanks and automated uh, uh, weapons devices to drive into the, uh, uh, into the plane. And then during the wet season, when they were bogged down, then the uh, Hmong would drive them back. It would be back and forth. And each time, you're losing a lot of men. The Hmong did not have a lot of men to spend. North Vietnam, we had a very lot of men that they could spend. Here you see a large family. Well, that's, you know, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, small farms. You need the help. And then for the parents, that's their social security there, those young people. And it just reminds me of my family. You know, my, my dad's family, he was one of 10. And then uh, I was one of three. And now our son's uh, family's two, uh, two kids. So it's, a, it's an inverted pyramid. And that happens as you move into different kinds of cultures. OK. So here's Nu Chu Chang. He's uh, collecting firewood. That's women's work. And uh, 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 farming and hunting, well, the man's work included farming, hunting, house building, tending farm animals, uh, being village leaders, shaman, iron and silversmith, musicians, but not collecting fire. That's, that was the Okay. And women's roles, wives of children, I'm going to just shift that over a little bit so we can see a little bit better. 
Okay. Uh, Elsewhere, company gathering firewood, tending gardens, smaller animal farms, and here you have a, a rice husker. You put some rice down there, and you pound on it, and you break that in the uh, the husks, and then you put it in the uh, basket. Okay. And here, winnowing the rice by throwing it up in the air, and the dry husks blow off, and the and the seed kernels fall down in. So you got to prepare. I mean, there's no going to the grocery store. You got to. You take the food as it is uh, in nature, and you have to uh, have to uh, work with it. Okay. And here, this is a uh, corn grinder. There's a uh, another stone here, and the stone goes back and forth when they pull it back and forth on this uh, lever here. Put some corn in there, and it grinds the corn into cornmeal, and the cornmeal will fall uh, fall down through. Uh, so Simpson's agriculture. Supports people, but it does not produce a surplus. And the communist uh, government in uh, Laos wants a surplus because they have to make money on it because that's what drives their economy. And so there's a basic uh, difference between the Hmong living in Laos now in the old way and the new way that the uh, communist government would like them to. And slowly but surely, they are settling them down on permanent farms. And uh, it's, uh, so the Hmong culture is changing irrevocably. Okay. And here you get a different view of the round stone with the round stone down there, and drop the corn in, and it grates in, in between. Okay. And you need water from a spring. Look at the heavy. I mean, you know, it's not a plastic pail. This is a heavy wooden bucket. This is women's work. And sometimes it would be uh, several miles from the village, so you'd have to carry it. <coughs> So he's filling it. Let's go to the next one. And now he's carrying it on uneven terrain with, filled with water. And that's not for the men to do. I mean, these were strong people. And they could really, uh, <clears throat> my grandmother was from Norway. She said, uh, you know why we live so long? Because we're always going uphill and downhill. She says, never ride in another like, elevator. And she's walk up the steps. <laughs> and it's good for you. And, uh, well, they certainly did a lot of that here. Okay. And because uh, Nu Chu Chen has come back, uh, they're really happy because usually visitors bring money that will help the community. So they're killing the bullock for a big celebration and uh, uh, welcoming Nu Chu Chen back to his, his family. The family is important. The plant is really important in the, uh, the culture that they come from. So here's a, uh, they have rich family life. That is not rich, you know, money, but they have, uh, the families get together, and this woman said, will you be back here in a little while? And I said, yeah, I'm going down, and we're gonna have to come back through here, through an interpreter, of course. She said, good, okay. And this is why. Uh, they all put on their traditional dress. Now, I've always been amazed, because whether you've been in, you know, in third world countries, whether there's slums and so forth, people work as maids and so forth, come out of these slovenly looking places with you know, just white uniforms. Say, so how did they do that? I didn't, haven't solved that yet. But here they came out with these beautiful costumes, and this is solid silver. This is her daughter and her daughter-in-law. They aren't that rich. So that's silver, but this is aluminum, made from down American aircraft. And uh, so they crafted it into looking like uh, they're wealthy, but they're really, really not. Uh, you had this because a lot of times you had to pick up and run. So to wear your wealth was really important, because as you run, you break off a piece of silver and, and use it if you had to buy something along the way. Okay. And this was in the town that I was in, a uh, prison. And uh, oddly enough, a group of uh, Buddhist monks are walking along. Uh, you can't maybe hardly see them over there, but I didn't even know they were there, I think, when I was taking the picture. Uh, but uh, it's after the war, the Hmong were trapped in an enemy country. Basically, they had fought against the group that none was taking over. And so the country was a prison, in a sense. So this is kind of a metaphor for that. You know, he was an actual prison, but the country itself becomes a prison. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I heard some chanting and some drums going, and I said, hey, 
is there a healing going on in the village? And the interpreter says, yeah, I think so. And so these daggers are warning evil spirits not to enter this place, that there is a spiritual thing going on, okay? And here is a shaman. He wouldn't let me take pictures uh, during the process of the healing. But now he's posing after. And he is standing on his horse. It's an actual horse that he uses to ride across the, the great sea to the spiritual land. And the process of getting the disease is you have about seven to nine souls, depending on which one you're talking to. And one of those souls may fall victim to an evil spirit and he takes it across the sea and begins to torment him. So now the shaman comes and he rides his horse across the sea, jumping up and down. He has a veil, this veil, red veil goes over his head, his face. And he jumps up and down on, the, uh, on this wooden sawhorse. And, and pretending or uh, actually spiritually riding this horse across this great sea, and he gets there. He says, Oh, Noah's sick here, you know, where's the spirit? And the spirit will come forward, and he said, What will happen? Uh, what, what can we do? And uh, uh, the spirit says, Well, you can sacrifice a pig, and he will become better. I'll take that and exchange the, uh, uh, the soul. So you get, you get uh, the person. Uh, uh, it's laying there, and you tie a string from his arm to the uh, leg of the uh, pig, and you kill the pig, and the souls go back and forth. Powerful psychosomatic medicine. I mean, if that doesn't you know, give you a little jolt, I don't know what would. And uh, so, but it's part of that spiritual existence maybe we associate with the Native Americans, where uh, the mountains, the rocks, the water, they all have spirit, and spirits are active in, in the lives around us. Animism is the kind of religion it is. Okay. And here are some of the tools of the shaman trade, some jingles, uh, uh, some uh, rice, uh, egg, pure water, some incense, uh, bullock horns that are, are cut in half, and you toss those like you might toss uh, uh, dice, and if one comes up on the curved end, one on the flat end, it means something, uh, and they interpret it from that point. And they'll also interpret uh, chicken tongues, and they have a lot of different ways of determining what the, the spirits are trying to tell us to do. Okay. So after it's over, and the pig has been sacrificed, uh, then they cook the pig and have a feast. So nothing goes to waste. The head of the pig goes to the shaman for doing the, the healing. And uh, they ask us to stay, but uh, we didn't have enough time. You can see the corn cobs that they're using for fuel. And uh, uh, just uh, that pot was boiling away, so I'm sure you know, it was hot enough and, and uh, it would have been good to eat, but uh, we didn't stick around to do that. Okay. So, another place that I was at, uh, this is the poster. And of course, uh, this guy's looking at a poppy bulb. And that poppy bulb can be made into opium. And so he's dreaming, he's looking at it, so, oh, I would love to be in that, he have that opium dream. But the opium dream down there, you can see him emaciated, uh, turns into a nightmare. So, let's go to the next one. Yeah, this, is part of, this is part of the Golden Triangle. This is where a lot of the opium in the world comes from, the poppies that are grown, at, at least at this time. This guy says, you want to see a poppy field? And I say, yeah, I'd like to see it. Okay. So we're out in the poppy field, and here's a guy, he's working away, and this is, I believe, is Lao rather than Mung, but the Mung know how to do this as well. And he's harvesting opium, so I said, can I come out and take a look? He said, sure, come on. Okay. And he's scratching the poppy balls with a three-bladed uh, knife, and those scratches are healed by the poppy ball with a, a rosin that comes in to, to fill the wound, just like our kind of pustle fill a wound for us, but this, this uh, uh, rosin is opium. So any animal or bird that, or uh, insect that wants to eat into the poppy ball, you know, it goes to sleep. Okay, that's a protection. So here you can see the excised uh, uh, poppy balls, and you come along, you do that uh, probably later in the day, and then in the morning before the sun gets too high, because you can't let this stuff dry, then it's no good. Then you come with a, a flat, flat piece of metal and scrape 
the opium in. And uh, then you put it into a, a little pouch. <coughs> now, the fact that they uh, produce 20 tons of this stuff every year is mind-boggling. The amount of poppies you have to grow and the amount of physical labor that it takes. But if that's the way that you're going to earn a living for your family, that's what they do. Okay. So here's a lady coming in. They use everything from the opium plant or poppy plant. Uh, leaves uh, the oil from the plant as well as the opium. Okay. So I said, do you have any opium? She oh yeah. And she brings out a little packet and says, yeah, that's what I was doing. So, uh, not, uh, not afraid to show it at all. Okay. So, I go up to my hotel room, and uh, yeah, I hear people talking and speaking English. So I step out, and it's a University of Green Bay professor and the Polish, this is the Polish ambassador. Yeah, and they're talking, and I said, what are you guys here for? And they said, well, we're analyzing the opium production for this year from Laos. I said, oh, then you saw that big poppy field on the way from the airport. Up here, and they said, No, we were talking. I said, Well, you know, you might want to go back and take a look because and they said, Well, if they're doing it that close to the highway, you can imagine what they're doing away from the highway. And these are not the people who get rich on, I mean, the, uh, the farmers who produce this. They're on the far bottom end of the pay scale. Uh, once you get it in to enhance and refine it and then cut it and then onto the street, everybody takes a big cut. And, uh, so they're trying to figure out how to stop this. Okay. So in the village, this was the, they said, you want to see an opium man? Hey, come on over here. And so they brought him over. And pretty emaciated and poor looking. And they ridiculed him and said, yeah, yeah, he can't control himself. His family is poor. He doesn't have a good house. And uh, he's always uh, getting opium and smoking it. And, and, uh, <coughs> and look what's happened to him. So next one. Do you know how old he is? No, I don't know how old. I should have asked. That's a good question too. And so uh, it's one of them said, "You want to come in my house?" And this is what he wanted to show me because a lot of trekkers through Laos, uh, from Europe and America, trek through village to village collecting opium and uh, smoking it, and that's uh, part of their their hiking path. And uh, he said, "No, I'm not part of that." You know, it's. Uh, it's, it wasn't about to, to start, but this is all the utensils along in the, uh, the cigarette lighter and so forth. So, do you want to try it? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> this is a, a magazine that's uh, uh, Bang Bao. He came to Wasa a number of times. Huge turnout of the Hmong population to see him. Uh, he was the man that uh, CIA worked with in, in the, uh, the military operations in Shangquan province. Uh, he died uh, a couple of years ago and, and uh, was marked here in, in Wasa as a, a very significant event by the, the Hmong population. Okay. And this also was on a magazine because I couldn't go to Longchen. And uh, that is the secret base of the CIA. Air America is one of the busiest airports in America because, I mean, in the world because CIA planes were coming in all the time. And uh, uh, a lot of the lone people from different parts of Shenkwang, whose villages were under attack, came here to, uh, to live as refugees. And that's before the war ends. That's during the war. Okay. So these are from the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. These are just pictures of what happened in 1975. Uh, well, actually, in 1973, we pulled out. So the Hmong and Royal Army kind of pulled out until 1975, but then when Vietnam falls and Cambodia falls to communism, uh, there really isn't any way for them to hold out any longer. And so the, uh, the Papalao and the North Vietnamese Army uh, converge on Long Chen, which is the last place of resistance. We organized a very hurried uh, uh, the escape route for the, the leaders that we thought would be executed, but not for the common rank and file. And so you can see that it's, uh, it's chaotic, American helicopters and planes taking people away while the, uh, the fighting goes on, and uh, of course Long Chan falls, and then uh, all of uh, Laos is under uh, communist control. Okay. So many people 
Uh, for the first couple of months, there wasn't many reprisals. But then later, there were attacks on villages. There were uh, reports of uh, uh, poisonous chemicals being sprayed on villages. There was uh, uh, villages that were massacred. And so uh, people who uh, maybe thought they could stay said, we got to get out of here. And so they take to the roads. And here you can see uh, they're moving down the roads. But any time they were seen on the roads, the, uh, the army would kill them. So they go off into the, uh, into the forest and the, the uh, uh, more protected areas, okay? And so they go through the waste areas, small groups, families mainly, and trying to live on, you talk to, to among people who are older about the way that they came to Bangunan. And those are really, really interesting stories because uh, they were existing on tree roots and grass roots and eating leaves and whatever they could find and making their way down toward the Mekong. Because on the other side of the Mekong, which means Great River, the Mekong is Thailand. Okay? Next. So here they get there. Well, these people were, they grew up in, in uh, the mountains. They didn't know how to swim. There were no rivers or ponds or, or lakes for them. And so they get here, they need a flotation device to get across. And meanwhile, they have uh, uh, guards who are watching for them and shooting them down if they can. If they did make it across at the start, Thailand didn't want them because they had a long rebellion of their own in their northern section, and they were going to bring revolutionaries to their, their territory, so they would turn them back and send them back. And uh, we didn't think that was right, so we in the UN said, uh, well, we'll rent 400 acres and make that into <coughs> Bangunai, Village of Discipline as a refugee camp. Okay. And many of them, uh, you can see they've got garbage bags they blew up and, and so forth, and uh, some of the older peoples, some of the younger peoples, uh, cries could be heard while they were swimming across as they were swept down the street because they just weren't strong enough to make that cross. And so the Mekong was one great, great area. We don't have any idea of how many of them were killed in the process of trying to, to escape Laos. Okay. Now, there's a dry period. That wouldn't be too bad. You could walk across here. But in the wet period, this would go up by 30 to 40 feet. This becomes a much bigger river, much different. And uh, you just couldn't plan always to be there during the dry period. Okay. So, on that day that uh, I got up to Bangunan, I hitched the ride with this, uh, this guy with his pickup. We got to the refugee camp. And uh, there was nobody there to talk to. And we drove all around, and finally uh, we saw a couple, of, I'll show you a little bit later, three Thai workers who were, just happened to be there. There's nobody's here on the weekends. We just left them alone, and then we come back on weekdays. And uh, said, we'll take you into town, about 30 kilometers away. So I hitched a ride with them, sent my pickup uh, on its way. And uh, I went to this really neat uh, clapboard hotel with a room that was over the Mekong, and you look down the cracks in the boards at the Mekong, and across into uh, to Laos. And uh, uh, I could also look down off the balcony into the big walk this uh, elderly lady was working on. Uh, she made the meals. That was the greatest food. They, she really, really was a good cook. And uh, that was $8 a day for three meals in the room. So it was, very nice, but I recommend it. <laughs> Rural Thailand is really, really wonderful. Uh, but next day was Sunday, so I get up and walk around and I'm, how am I going to go about this? Sister Pierre comes walking up behind me and I hear this French accent of voice say, oh, What are you doing here? And I look back and I told her about Wassa and the refugees. And she, she said, Come with me. There was no Willie Cummings. Come with me. You're coming with me. So we went over and here's Father John from the wild. And uh, uh, she says, we're going to have mass. And I said, well, you know, do you mind uh, Lutheran taking part in it? And they said, we don't care. You know, we, the net gets very fine, you know, very loose right here. That's not a fine mesh. And uh, so uh, he was a serving priest, and she was a helper, and I was the congregation. And so we went through that. And then afterwards, John, Father John says, well, you can't take photos in, in Bangkok without a special permit. But if you're working for me, you can take all you want. So you're working for me right now. 
He says, you're going to need a vehicle. So when I get there, you can come along. And then once I'm, I'm there, then you've got the truck, you can go around and do whatever. Just pure luck that I, I did, got the uh, uh, situation that I did. Sister Pierre is delightful. She's really, really interesting. Okay. <clears throat> okay, here you have uh, the story cloth. Uh, you know, here's the people that uh, about 40 years before I was there knew their valley, not too much about what was outside their valley and so forth, or, or fighting wars. And all of a sudden, they knew a whole map of the, the world and they could point at relatives all over the place. South America, uh, US, Europe, and different places, Africa, and different places. And uh, so, you know, it's from this traditional people to becoming worldwide. Really, really changed. Okay. Here's the three time workers I was mentioning. Uh, a lot of fun. Every time I saw them, we, we had a great time. Okay. So, what does the refugee camp look like? Uh, there was no barbed wire. There was about 58,000 Hmong when I was there. Uh, I said, well, what if they wander off? They said, the farmers around here don't like the fact they're here at all. So they'll send them back. So he says, we don't worry about them trying to escape or anything. This is a uh, safe, but you can see the thatched houses. Uh, for about $50, they could build themselves a house. Get the thatching material and the stuff. You know, they originally built the houses with tin roofs. But in the heat of this area, the heat can go through the thatch, but it bounces back in the tin. And uh, so those basically they thought were ovens, so they wouldn't live in. You know, but then they also could grow some gardens and so forth in the meantime. Okay. This is from a magazine just to kind of show you a little bit of the layout. Thatched huts, uh, tin roof to uh, buildings. Okay, that's not a good picture. Uh, yeah, the high, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees ran the camp. Uh, it's looked upon by the communist world, the solid, the Western, of course. Uh, but I got a kick out of this one because these women were looking in the, the mirrors of this bicycle and just having a high old time. They were laughing and laughing and laughing. Uh, seeing the reflection of their own troubled monk culture, possibly. Being a refugee is when you're disenfranchised, you have no voice. It uh, means poverty. It means you're alienated from your culture. It means you're dependent on somebody else. Uh, it's just really, really a difficult position to be in. Okay. Foucault, who is a, a philosopher, said refugee camps are total institutions. Uh, they're a way of Managing power and granting asylum. I mean, they're total. They, you, you are totally at the uh, uh, dependent on others for for things and the way you're going to behave and so forth. Uh, they had to be concerned about the push and pull because uh, if you made life too easy there at the refugee camp, more people from Laos would be coming in. Also, the farmers already were jealous of the stuff that was coming in to feed them when they're not being well fed themselves. So you could, you could cause discomfort around me. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's a really <coughs> tough, tough balance that you've got to meet. Uh, this was chicken day. Uh, pick, uh, uh, dump truck came and dumped the chickens <laughs> up here. Okay. Uh, 90 degrees. Uh, different days they got uh, fish. There are other staples that they got for the week were rice, vegetables, coconut oil, and, and firewood. And then they would take this and hand out uh, so many grams per family for the week. Okay. And uh, no electricity, of course, so you had no refrigeration. Uh, when we prepared the meals, you take those chickens home and cook it up right away so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't waste. Uh, they're busy doing the household things, and the men have no role at all. There's no place for them. Their traditional man uh, things aren't, aren't there. International Relief organizations that ran this was UN bodies. Uh, national governments would donate. And NGOs, private charities. And the media getting the word out about uh, the needs of the, uh, the refugee camp. <coughs> and that's what ran this camp, basically. And you can see one guy's uh, family's uh, load of chicken there. Okay. In the mountains, the Hmong word for water meant pure. 
So all of a sudden they get in 400 acres with shallow wells. And also, when you have to go to the bathroom in, uh, in their villages, well, you just step out into the fields and fertilize them. And if you did that in this 400 acres with 53,000 people, you followed up the water supply pretty quickly. <clears throat> so you can see the brackish stream going by here. This is a shallow well. If you drink that water, dysentery is a most likely uh, result. And uh, that's what the three Thai workers, their job was to educate and say, no, you have to drink the water that we provide. This pure thing we call pure is not pure. It's causing disease, and they said, no, no, disease is caused by the spirit being yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, so it's, it was really a, a big education effort. Okay. So here's the water up in the tanks, and you brought your jerry cans and your little cart, and you got them filled up for the day. Uh, they weren't always enough to slack the surf, the thirst for the complete day, and so some people would drink the, the, the uh, water they weren't supposed to. And, the inevitable result. Okay. If you got money from like the US or other places, Canada or France, or where uh, some of the people are going, you get some money, then you could, there were shops set up. And you could buy from, uh, uh, from uh, Thai farmers. You could buy some, some foodstuffs, okay, to supplement what you were getting. Uh, this is just the same old germ theory, traditional disease as the spirits. So when you walked into one of the, their houses, you begin, you know, here's gold foil with blood and chicken feathers uh, stuck to it. And that is just a warning for evil spirits who are going to come into the house. They would see that and they would go away. So they're bringing their animism with them. Okay. So that has something to do with, with the medical situation here. Uh, UN. High Commissioner for Refugees uh, provided very good medical facilities. Here's Dr. Ustahaus, he's a Dutch doctor. I said, well, how are things going? He said, oh, he's seen a little, they get sick, they go to the shaman. If one shaman doesn't help them, they go to another one. If he doesn't help them, they go to another one. And they're next to dying, then they come to me and expect me to, you know, to save them. And so he's very frustrated. He said, uh, we're at the end of the line. We ought to be at the front. Uh, you know, when they first get it, we could treat things. We get every kind of medicine you would want here. And the facilities are excellent. Okay. Now, this is the part of the scene. He just said, we have no shortage of medicine. But anything we need, we can get it just like that. Okay. Just here. Okay. Uh, in 1989, there were no dentists. By 1990, Burmese dentists had trained refugees, uh, dental technicians, mainly in pulling out teeth. So if a tooth was bothering them, they'd pull. But at least something was being done by somebody who knew kind of what they were doing. Okay. What are the roles of men, women, and children when they're refugees? It's part of a larger world political and economic order now. It's really changed. Okay. And this is the uh, population was the highest reproduction rate of any po similar population in the world. And if you talk to uh, people about that, they say, well, you know, our family, uh, there's so many spirits in our family and so many of them are dead. Those spirits are wandering around waiting new bodies to be born into. So they're filling their families back out, was the, uh, um, the word I got. So this is a very lonely office. Okay. Lots of refugee children, you know, going to France, going to Canada, going to the U.S., going back to Laos. Nobody knows. At that time, anyway. Okay. And this little girl's adopted me, so I'd walk along and they would come up behind me. Hello, hello, which is the word they knew. And you turn around and say hello, and then people would scatter into the, the different houses and different buildings. And they turn around and say walking, and they were right up behind me again. This time I caught them, and I was able to take a picture. Okay. Special feeding of children fall below 80% of the recommended body weight. They got the special feeding until they were 85% above, above the body weight for three consecutive weeks. And once they reached that, they were cut off from the special feeding again. Okay. And Sister Pierre, when I headed up the leprosy or the Hansen's disease, 
they were isolated. Nobody in the camp wanted them there, so they had to build a, a little facility just outside the walls. And uh, uh, Sister Pierre had lined up the family. The father had lost his nose, and uh, you know they cured it because you can cure it, but people in Asia government didn't understand that. And uh, so uh, she had arranged with Cleveland uh, Clinic to reconstitute the nose for this guy and to send the family back over here because the children and the wife were going to have to be isolated in, in uh, uh, leprosy colonies. Well, the time it came for them to leave, and the shaman said, Oh, if you go uh, to the U.S., you're going to die and your spirit won't be reborn again, and so forth. And so he went and hit. So that flight took off. Well, now the next time was coming the next day. And uh, she, Sister Pierre had him put in jail. And him locked up. And that night at supper, Father John said, you can't do that. You can't, I don't care what you think about the mother and the children, you can't deny him his right to say no. And she said, but the children, and, and they have no choice in the matter. They should have a choice. And so these two good friends who have been there for years, uh, really had a, a very long, drawn out debate on this. I left early the next morning, so I never found out what happened. And when I arrived next year, I found out Sister Pierre, shortly after that, had been retired to a, a retirement place in, in France. So it's just an interesting comment. Okay, we'll go through these last ones fairly quickly. Uh, I'm talking with students. Uh, they're looking at Pine Valley Health Course uh, scorecards, by the way. And I'm in the back talking with uh, other students about different states and different cities that they had relatives in. Okay. And these kids were learning uh, uh, English and different uh, lessons in the morning and in the afternoon they were teaching other Hmong kids. And you can see the national duo. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> we're hurrying through here. Uh, okay. Uh, but the poignant story about this, uh, this kid was uh, the story that somebody had about wandering through the forest and then getting across the Mekong and, you know, not knowing what was going to happen to him. His older brothers and sisters had gone to the United States. A one family never had to stay with the parents. The parents wanted to go back to Laos. He was the one. And so he says, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know how to do this. Anything in Laos, uh, farming on hillsides or any of these kinds of things. So uh, in 1990, when I got there, the vocational training for the returning to Laos was uh, uh, was big. And the time to decide was there. The Thailand did not want these people in the country any longer. And they were saying, you have to leave. Okay. Either go to a third country or, or not. Tradition changed, third world solution. Uh, it's a uh, built-in conflict of the generations. Uh, here you have her dressed in uh, traditional with the tennis shoes. Uh, you know, it's that kind of, uh, uh, next year, okay. <coughs> and this is where they did the, uh, a lot of the sewing uh, as well, the cross stitch and the applique and, and so forth. And a uh, Colorado State University teacher of art came and said, you can't use, they use black and neon colors, the big ones. And she said, no, no, you have to subdue the uh, sides of the colors and subdue the colors so that American people will buy and people in different uh, areas. So she really took a traditional art and made it commercial, in a sense. Okay. The athletic field is the only athletic field that was there. There's a soccer field, you can see the goal. They had two flat soccer balls, so they went back to the following year, I, I brought two new ones. Okay. And here's a refugee working on his, repairing his roof, but it's a temporary place, it's not his. He'll be moving on, but the question of where and what are still there, okay. And here's an elderly lady walking along very determinedly with some scrap of plastic, and you wonder, what she gonna do with that? You know, it's really, really interesting. Okay. Number of Hmong in the U.S., 260,000. I think this is 2010 uh, statistics. Uh, number of Hmong in Wisconsin, 49,000. Uh, number of Hmong in Laos right now is about half a million. That's 2010 census. Okay, I think that's going to be it. That'll be a sunset on the way. Uh, 
Yeah, for the sunset. Okay. Any questions? We're probably answering everyone, right? <laughs> it's just a really an interesting, uh, interesting fun trip actually, because you've met people that were deciding really fundamental issues, and uh, they wanted to talk in those kind of fundamental terms, you know, and it wasn't just ordinary conversation, it was, you know, what, what's it like over in the U.S., and what role can we play, and the older generation and say, well, we're not, we don't have the language, and we say, yeah, that's going to be a real problem, and the young saying, we want to get there because we want to start at being something. If you're in a refugee camp, you're well. You're maybe nothing, and so uh, it's, you know these were these were really interesting uh, conversations. And, uh, it's, so I came back and did a lot of talks in schools and you know, social services groups. You know, I'm doing it at uh, assisted living places. And pretty soon I'll be in the assisted living place in one of the Sorry, come on. Yeah. Tell me a little bit um, what the kids did all day long. Much. I was told that they didn't send them to school because they didn't want them to learn government propaganda. Yeah, it's there was a there was a the schools were crowded, so there were there were some going there. But yeah, there's that division of, uh, of people who didn't want their kids to go because they want to go back to Laos, and uh, of course, none of them. That's the decision that they make. And uh, once the third world deciders move to uh, US or Canada or Australia or France or whatever, uh, those who were left were taken back into Laos. And uh, there the, uh, the government has uh, settled them and uh, into settlements. And of course, they want them to farm in a sense that's uh, uh, commercial so that they can make money on, uh, on taxes. And also, uh, for many, many years, around Long Chen in the far west, there was a low, slow-burning uh, insurrection of the Thai, or the Hmong that were still in the forest around there. And so they didn't trust them either, the, uh, the government. So, you know, those are the decisions that people had to make. A lot of young men in Bangunai would sneak out and go over to uh, uh, across the river and go in and fight and then come back. And when I was in that hospital, I was standing talking to the doctor, and these two guys were laying on cots, just shaking uncontrollably. And I said, What's wrong with them? He said, Well, they, they were across the Mekong, they just got back today. And he said, The, the percentage of parasite in the blood system is just too high. He said, They'll be dead by, by night if they didn't wear it. And, uh, well, you know, I, I worked as a mortician for a little while, but I've never had anybody stand and say, well, no rain problem. These two guys aren't going to make it. Of course, they wouldn't understand the English anyways. Mary, you did something? Or? Well, I, I was wondering how things were going now, and I also wondered what, where that priest went. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry about a different priest, but that's not him. So, I don't know. I don't know. Father John was a delightful guy. Right sense of humor. And uh, the uh, Protestants had a place, the Catholics had a place. The, uh, uh, there, were, there were some analyst places too where they could talk to Shaman and stuff. So. Yeah, Mary? I was wondering about corn. Is that a new world plant? Yes. And so, what, what's the story on that? You know? oh. no, I think, well, the corn gets, you know, uh, Peppers in Thailand with all the food's hot. Well, before well, the new world, <laughs> and tomato from the Italians for pizzas, you know, that's the new world. And, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly new crops spread throughout the world. And uh, uh, corn, and of course, in, in China grows a lot of corn as well. And, uh, Southeast Asia, you find it. But in the wetland rice areas, rice is the, the primary one in China, if you go to Manchuria, where there's a thriving dire dairy industry. I was looking, 1980, I was really looking forward to playing basketball with a little Chinese young. Uh, well, up in Manchuria, we were 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", we were looking up in. 
You get down into the rice area, it's south of the Yangtze River there. That's the more typical, but that's a rice diet. They don't get as much protein and calcium. So, so I assume that, I mean, I know the mom here used rice, but they, if they were living on the hillside, they had kind of dry. They had dry, dry rice, yes, dry rice. Right. Mm -hmm. Or they could go into the villages down below if they had an animal to sell and buy some of the rice down there. From your numbers, it seemed to me that most of the Hmong never left Laos. Though. Yeah, that's right. Is that right? Yes. Uh, they may do, and uh, the government strictly wants to control them. They have uh, set up a, uh, a harsh, but uh, you know, that's happened to uh, tribal people all over the world. The Native Americans did not have a good go here. And uh, the uh, in uh, the outback in uh, Australia, they didn't have a good goal of it. And uh, the same thing. Modern civilization comes in and just really destroys that culture and uh, what's taking its place. You know. Hope it's something positive. That, that movie that some of kids had us watch, Hunted Like Animals, is that a bit of an exaggeration? Or? I haven't seen that. I think that must be. After my time, the uh, uh, kind of I still read when I see things about the moon, but uh, uh, basically this is uh, going back to those time periods for me. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.